Well, hello everyone. My name is Morgan Harper Nichols and I am an artist and an author and I'm so excited for you to join me here today. This is a live signing. So this is a way that we can connect and you will also be able to get a signed book if, you know, obviously not in an in-person event, but still able to connect virtually. And like I said, you'll be able to get a book, out, you're getting a book out of this as well. So yeah, speaking of books, the book I'm talking about is Peace is a Practice. And if you'd like to get one, if you haven't already, there's a link right here. And for those of you who've already signed up, I'm going to, and a little bit later, answering some of your questions. I'm super excited about that. But for a moment, I just wanted to take a time to just, one, welcome everybody, and two, just talk a little bit about this book and why this book is here and why I'm talking about it and why now. So I am, I, and this, I'm, this has a greater context, that's why I'm sharing it, but I am 32 years old. And at 31 years old, which was just a short while ago, <laughs> I was diagnosed with autism. I have been struggling throughout my life in various capacities um, with everything from some sensory issues to not uh, having some like communication differences. Like one example of that is my natural speaking voice. I don't naturally have a lot of inflection. So if you ever hear me say like, oh, wow, or that's so nice, or hello, that's all very practiced. And now that I know that, it is so helpful. But I spent three decades of my life not knowing why everyday life often felt so difficult, why the simplest things in life felt like just would absolutely drain me. Like another example is I'm not able to always pick up on humor or sarcasm. So I have stories from elementary, middle school, high school, college, and beyond where I would get embarrassed. I would feel ashamed or, or because I couldn't quite understand like the, the social cues or whatever it is. So those are just a couple of many, 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 many examples. And of course, you know, autism, it's going to look different from, from person to person on the spectrum. And while I was getting diagnosed, one thing that I, I ended up learning and seeing as we look back at my whole life was that while there were also, while there were so many challenges and so many things that I didn't have answers for, one thing that was true was that I was learning how to breathe through it. I was learning how to inhale and exhale and find peace in the present moment, whether it was the sensory overload from loud sounds or bright lights, or it was just struggling to communicate or do a job the right way, whatever it was, I can look back and see that all along there was grace that was helping me learn how to breathe through each moment and find peace in the moment. And that just helped me see like, wow, I don't have it all figured out. And there's still things that I struggle with today, but it is comforting to know and empowering to know and to realize that I have been practicing finding peace all along. So that's what this book is about. It's, it's about, it's an invitation for you to also look at your life and see what are the ways in which you've been learning how to practice peace through everything that you've been through and that you are going through? And how is that something you can continue to practice? So I want to take a moment to um, read to you some, uh, this is probably one of my favorite parts of the book because I feel like it, it just really speaks to the heart of where I was coming from in writing it. So I want to just take a moment to read. It's not very long. It's just a little bit about finding peace and practicing peace in daily life. Every day I notice lights and all its nuances, but I feel like I notice just as many shadows. I look out the window at the sunrise, but I also see the trees that block my view and keep me from seeing the full range of the sun's glory. 
I see a metal power line beam towering high above the trees. It's roped with a dozen black cords stretched to the furthest point of tension in both directions. So yes, there's the sunrise, but there's also all of these other obstructions. And perhaps you have had experiences like this too. You were trying to have a quiet evening while your upstairs neighbor decided to rearrange your living room. Your one day off was filled with unexpected phone calls. You spent time with people you love, but you kept thinking about who wasn't there. You were enjoying a glorious sunset, but it came on the heels of a tough day. You remembered the smallest details about the conversation that night under the moonlight, the way he laughed, the way he listened to your stories, and you also remembered how that was the last time you saw each other. The reason why you remember both sides of these experiences is because all your life you have been learning to paint with both shadows and light. You have been learning how to find the gold amid the dust, even in uncertainty. You crank up the music that takes you back to 2003, even though life wasn't perfect back then. You look at pictures of old friends and smile, even though you don't see each other anymore. You've learned how to appreciate both the shooting stars and the flashing lights on the bottom of an airplane soaring high in the sky in the dead of night. You've learned how to hold it all and be all right. Not perfect, but all right. You have been practicing peace your whole life. You've been taking notice of the good, the bad, and everything in between, how to feel it all and still breathe. And that is page 25, 26 of this book. And I just started right from the beginning of this book. I'm like, I just want the person who is encountering this book, I want you to feel empowered and, 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 and in a position and a posture of recognizing, oh, wait a second, like, this isn't about like finding like a whole list of, of new things that I need to, to practice. Yes, that's a part of it. I'm all for finding new practices. But it's also about recognizing that you already have a foundation to work with, you already have a starting point. And this is something that you can continue to build and to grow with with time. So another thing, Thing that I did to do that in this book to kind of just encourage this idea of like, keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, this is, so I am an artist, but this is not like an art book, but I, I couldn't resist like having some art in this book. So I wanted to take a moment to show you, and we're going to be doing a little bit of art as well. And I hope it's something you could practice at home in just a little bit, but I wanted to take a moment to show you some of the images for the different chapters in the book and how they are there as visual cues to help remind you of this practice that it's, that you're able to practice in your daily life practicing finding peace and cultivating peace in daily life. So the first image here is a preface. Um, this is just a, a blue circle, as you can see. And you'll see a lot of themes of circles in this book, and that's very intentional because I begin to see peace as something that looks a lot like freedom to breathe. And as I started to research breathing and our respiratory cycle, I started to see that there's often a circle and the artist in me just couldn't resist the circle that is sometimes used to illustrate an inhale, exhale cycle. And I just couldn't resist like the the, the, art, the art part of that, the visual part of that, of this breath that we just go on back and forth over. And if you've ever heard, you know, you may hear people say things like return to the breath. That's where that comes from because we're, we're returning to a breath. The breath isn't like something that we're just that, like we're stacking like number one, breath number one, breath number two, breath number three. It's more of like a cycle. It's a cycle that we go in and out of over and over and over again. And I'm like, wow, that's like a, that's kind of like a life practice. A practice is something that you go back and forth with over and over again. And I'm like, yeah, I think it's the good things in life, like breathing and, and finding peace and finding peace through breathing. That is absolutely something that we have to practice. So you'll see a lot of, um, you'll see a lot of circles throughout the book as you, as you flip through. 
So peace is a practice. Um, at the very beginning of the book, I define peace as a river. And if you look closely in this image, this is very, very, um, you'll, you'll see it's kind of like a, a river running through, running through a forest that's, that's kind of like a wilderness. And in the beginning of the book, I talk about how I found inspiration in the song, It Is Well With My Soul, where the author Horatio Spafford, he wrote in, that, in the song, It Is Well With My Soul, the very first line of the song is, when peace like a river attendeth my way. And the story of that song is Horatio Spafford was actually writing that when he was about to go and meet his wife after they had lost their four daughters in drowning, to drowning in the sea. And when I think about, you know, I, I've never known a grief like that, but I, I can only imagine that's some of the worst grief you can know to lose a child, to lose your children. And when I think about how, it was peace like a river. I was like, that doesn't seem like a coincidence because a river is something that you have to go out and seek and find in a wild, in the wild. You know, it's not like it's not like an ocean shore that just goes along for hundreds and hundreds of miles and you can just find it easily. A river is actually relatively hard to find. I actually had an experience yesterday. I live in Arizona and I was driving. And I was driving over, I was like, it looks like I'm coming up on a river. You know, I'm writing a book about rivers and stuff. I was getting excited. And I was like, you know, maybe I can get out and take a picture. And I pull up on the river and actually my husband was driving. I pull up and I look and the, the river was just completely dry, uh, dried up. Like it was just gone. Like you could tell there had been a river there and there were mountains all around in Arizona. We have tons of mountains everywhere. And you could see, I'm like, oh, I can see where the river used to be, but it's just not there anymore. And I was like, wow, sometimes seeking peace feels like that. And I can even see how in a place of grief where you're seeking, you're looking for that river, you're looking for that solace. And it's something that you have to practice seeking. So I talk a lot about that right at the beginning of the book and how also even in my own lineage, I grew up in a in a, a African American Christian tradition. And I specify that because it was from that experience that I was able to learn from a for me, faith and 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 history and family history have been intertwined in a lot of interesting ways. And I tell the story about visiting the first African Baptist church in Savannah, Georgia. And I talk about how as a kid I learned that there were holes that were drilled in the floor of this church. And it's believed that those holes were to create breathing room for the the slaves who were trying to escape slavery beneath the church, beneath the floorboards. And as somebody who is, is in the present tense, someone who hopes to share hope and grace and encouragement and who identifies as a Christian, I think about those holes in the floor all the time. I'm like, that's what I want my work to be. I want my work to be something that says, hey, I, I acknowledge that the peace that I'm seeking in my life is something that other people are seeking. And what can I do to make that possible for others? So when I think about the song, It Is Well With My Soul, when I think about that church and I talk about those things very early on, I see that river. I see it as something, yeah, this is something carved into the wild, carved into the church floorboards. It's something that we have to slow down and seek. And then um, going into the book, Practice is a Cycle. I've already talked a bit about that and just the circular motion of practice being something that we, it's a cycle that we go through. It's not something that we just master right away. It's something that we have to continue to go through um, and cycle through throughout our life. Shadow and Light. This one's kind of self-explanatory. This is the one that I that I read from at the very beginning, page 26, just shadow and light coming together and recognizing that practicing peace doesn't mean just ignoring all the shadows in life and just acting like nothing's ever happened, but it's recognizing that there's shadow and light. There's inhale and exhale. And then there's also a chapter on, um, on rhythm, 
on rhythm. So if you look at the very big cover of the book, you'll see this book is about finding new new rhythm for life. And I'm a musician, so I took that very, very literally. And I talk about finding rhythm and what we can learn about practicing rhythm in our life. And again, that's not something that we have to just master and figure out in one swoop. It's something that we can continue to practice throughout our life. This is the artwork for the chapter wholeness. And in this chapter, I really focus on something that I think has, has made it very difficult for me to find peace that I'm sure others can relate to as well. And that was when I became a parent. And that was when I gave birth for the first time. Um, and well, the only time <laughs> to my one child. And I talk about how no one really prepared me for what that felt like after and how long it took for me to to feel like myself again and how at times like that could feel very sort of disorienting your your body is just doing all this all this new stuff that <laughs> you that you've never done before and it could be very very hard to to look in the mirror and see and feel like oh, I could take a deep breath and be grateful for who I am so it's something that I wanted to write about because I know that you know, when it comes to our bodies, sometimes it can be very hard to to feel whole and and whole in our body and 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 like we have that freedom to breathe. And this is a chapter where I go even deeper into that freedom. I, I this is why I love abstract art because for me, abstract art is freedom. It's like yes, there are some rules and, and some things about color and color palette that are really valuable and important. But at the end of the day, once you kind of master those few skills, you're able to really explore and just be free. And that's something that I just wanted to bring in as I talked about that in the book. So there's quite a bit more art. I'll just kind of flip through and, and rest. In the chapter on rest, I talk about candles specifically and how we can use candles um, to find rest. I talk about I talk about trusting and I kind of see trusting as, as this, it's like kind of like bu the building blocks, but they keep moving. <laughs> you're trying to like, you're trying to like, okay, okay, I've got this part figured out. Can I, can I stand on this thing? Like, is this, is this little statue or, you know, um, series of steps I've created? <laughs> can I stand? And it takes time and practice for, for that to come together. So yeah, there's quite a, uh, there's a chapter on letting go and there's quite a few, quite a bit of art in here. And I, and I created that for each section. I spent a long, long time thinking about that and painting that because I really wanted to help as much as possible show that this, this concept of pieces of practice, it's, it's, it's not just intellectual. It's something that we can use and bring all of our available senses into the fold so that we can practice peace in, in daily life by practicing what it means to find that freedom to breathe. So speaking of painting, I want to do a little bit of painting. I'm so excited to share with you some of my, my painting practice. And this is something that anyone can do. If you don't know anything about painting, if you've never painted before, that is absolutely okay. This is something that you can, hopefully you could just enjoy watching, but you can also enjoy um, doing as well in case you're interested. So what I'm actually going to be doing is I'm going going to be for the first time with this book I'm going oh sorry the camera's flipped so I reached back the wrong way I'm going to be actually painting inside of the books a little bit so right here I want to show you this is some art that I've made that is just a practice so this is not an art piece of art that I'm selling anywhere. I think I shared a little bit of it on social media when I first made it, but it's not anything that's like that's that I was creating with the frame of mind of a product or a social media post. This was just me practicing. This was me just painting as a way of being present to the moment. And I think that is honestly some of the best use of creativity. Of course, you can make products and, and put things out there and post on social media. But at the end of the day, it's a way to be present to the moment. And for many of us, it's a way to connect with our inner child or, you know, something that we may have enjoyed doing when, when we were kids. So that's what I'm going to be doing, just having a little bit of fun. It's not even necessarily about like creating this, <laughs> this grand thing as much as it, it is just entering into that practice. So what I have here, if I can remember which way to turn, what I have here is some paints, and I'll go over that in a second. 
And I have three books. I'm going to be painting in these books. And you might actually be able to get one. So if you haven't gotten your book yet, these will be kind of scattered about. And you might end up with one of them. So I, I just am really excited about that. You might end up with one of these books that I'm painting in. And then I have a mason jar here that I am pretty sure was uh, some spaghetti sauce. <laughs> and I always save the spaghetti sauce jars and I rinse them out and I use them for painting. So the supplies here that I have, I have a mason jar, some water, I have some paint brushes, and I actually even have like a mix of brushes, like a couple of these I just found like at my local craft store. I think one of them might be from like the art store, like the fancy art <laughs> art store. But you, can, I have done this with like kids paint brushes. So you don't need fancy materials. You can literally use anything. But I will say I do love my fancy paints. This is gold, golden. They're kind of famous, famous paint. Lots of artists use golden paint. And there's this one paint called Pathalo Blue, and I might be saying that wrong, but that's what I'm going to be using today. So if you want to take a picture of that, I just want to hold it up because this paint is really fun. It's, it's definitely, you know, it's not beginner paint, but I, I feel like it's something that if you just want to treat yourself and just, and because I think sometimes that is hard. It's like, you might be like, oh, I would like to treat myself and paint with some nice paints but maybe you don't know where to start or maybe you feel intimidated by having to get every color. So I recommend just getting one color, just, just getting this blue. That's all you need. Like you don't have to go out and buy every color in the rainbow. You could just get one color and that's all I'm going to be using today. So um, I have the book and that's the last thing that I have. Now, the tricky part is I'm going to try my best to show you how I do this um, <laughs> while, while also filming and having this camera like this. So the very first thing that I like to do whenever I'm just painting with the color blue is I just try to dab a little bit of the paint. This is a brand new one. So let me open it. All right. And I already have paint on my finger, but I guess that's the fun part. <laughs> So yeah, that's just me. Um, I also love that I decided to wear a white sweater for this as well. <laughs> I didn't really think that through. But hey, sometimes that's the fun in it. Uh, <laughs> it's not that messy. I'm just a little on the clumsy, messy side myself. But yeah, all you need is a little drop of paint. I'm going to show you where how I'm going to do that. So just want to put a little bit of paint on whatever it is you're painting. It could just be one drop or two. And then the next thing that you're going to do is you have your water here, your mason jar. And then you're going to take your damp brush and then you're just going to paint some lines. Just like that. And the cool thing about this is like the more you actually, um, the more you kind of let it sit for a moment, it kind of starts to, you know, seep into the page a little bit and get a little bit more dimension. Obviously it's a little different when I'm using, I'm not using like art paper and I'm doing it inside of a book, but you'll start to see like just painting a little bit here and there. It just creates some dimension, just really cool. And this is something that I just enjoy doing that's very soothing to me. I'm not really thinking necessarily even about composition at this point. I'm just painting as a way of like, oh, I like the way that this brush feels when I'm moving it across the page. I just, I like the way that feels. And then another thing that you can actually do so let's say you're you're like, oh, I kind of like this, but I'd like to add a little something else. So I'm going to take the, the cover off the book just for a second here. So 
there's a, something in art about uh, about creating contrast with what you're doing. So I have this watercolor here and what you can actually do, <laughs> I'm really struggling with the flip camera here, but what you can actually do is take like an ink pen or something and just create a different kind of texture. So I'll show you what that looks like. Now, when I drew this line, I was thinking, okay, I don't actually know what this is. And maybe people might be a little thrown off by that, or they don't understand, you know, like, what is this for? But that's the, that's sort of the beauty of abstract art is that you can kind of do anything you want with it. So I'll show you how I can kind of even take this a little further and play with lines. So I'm going to go over here and I'm just going to draw like a little black dot. Well, it's not really a dot, it's more of a circle. And that becomes kind of like a sun or a moon on this landscape. And I can even take it a little bit further. I can draw a few little birds. And just like that, it's starting to come to life and it's in its own little way. It's starting to, just with a few lines and a little bit of color, it's starting to take on a life all on its own. So yeah. And then at the bottom here, I'm just going to sign my name. So yeah, I'm going to do that a couple more times just to kind of see what we can come up with. And, and again, I'm just using one color and I'm painting inside the book. And if you get one of my books and you want to paint in it, feel free. Like, I would love that. <laughs> I would love that if you were just like, yeah, I, I just felt like painting in it. And I started painting on um, you know, some of the front pages or whatever. I think that's really cool. So this time around, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the dot in the middle of the page. All right. Oh, that's a little bit bigger than I intended, but that's okay. All right, I'm going to, got my jar here. This is another thing that's cool. It's like once you dip that blue brush back into the jar, Oh, it's just so pretty. It gets harder to, to maintain that the more colors you add. But with blue, oh my gosh, I just, I just love looking at it. So here we go. You're just going, oh, I'm getting it. It's getting a little bit messy here because I'm, ideally you want to do this on a flat surface. So <laughs> that would be ideal. But, you know, it kind of looks cool. I actually really like that. I like the I like the way that it's stripping there. I think that that's actually really, really fascinating. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's an option. It's like you don't even necessarily have to paint the full page. You can just do a few strokes in the same direction and just see what happens and just watch the dimension come to life. Like, Watch the contrast kind of take on a life of, of its own. And what I love about this too is it ends up being a lesson for life. It's like, wow, we can find a rhythm doing these simple things. But even after you repeat that process over and over, every time does it look the same. Every time you do it, it's not exactly the same, but altogether it tells a story. Altogether it creates it creates a portrait. So I happen to really like when I have moments like that where I can see, I'm like, wow, this is actually teaching me in a way that I didn't expect. So yeah, I actually really like this one. It kind of looks like waves. We can do a few little birds here, a, little, a few little se seagulls, I should say, flying over the waves. Yeah, there we go. So now when you open this book. I'm going to leave it open <laughs> to let it dry, but that's there. I actually really like that one. And the last one, now let's, so the first one we painted at the top. The second one we started in the middle. So now with this one, we're going to start at the bottom. And um, that, that also is kind of a, a little cue when it comes to making art. It's like, if you've ever done any photography class or anything like that growing up, um, you may have heard the concept of the rule of thirds and that absolutely applies to making artwork. So you wanna 
you want to give yourself like, cause sometimes it, it can be very intimidating to just look at like a blank piece of page and be like, Oh, I don't want to make it. I don't want to mess it up or I don't want to do the wrong thing. There's no undo button. So just, just pick a third, like pick a third. So this is a third of the page. This is a third of the page. That's a third of the page. So just pick a third and then decide, okay, I'm going to just go from this third to the end. I'm going to go from here up to the, the middle third, if that makes sense. So I'm not a huge fan of math, but that's the math that I will tolerate because I think it does actually <laughs> help to ease some of that anxiety around painting um, and, and not knowing where to start on a blank canvas. So yeah, we're going to start at the bottom with a little bit of blue. You can't really see it there, but yeah, it's just a little dab. And I'm going to try to hold it flat so we don't, so I don't, get blue paint all over my sweater. <laughs> and where did I put my brush? Okay, here we go. So I'm just gonna move this paint and my water here across the bottom of the page. So this could be a cool, you know, minimalist approach. Like maybe you're, you're like, I, I just want a little bit of something. Well, there you go. Just like that. That tells a story. So we're just playing with that bottom third right there. And um, you can probably tell by looking behind me, I'm not really a minimalist. So <laughs> it takes some effort to uh, <laughs> to not fill the whole page. I'm a little, I'm a little bit like just paint everywhere ah, and then edit later. Um, <laughs> so it takes me some practice. But it's a good practice. It's, it's good for me to practice that. So we've got our little mountains right here. And also just going to keep playing with that lower third. Going to add some, add a little sun there. And also some little birds. I love my little kindergarten V-shaped birds. And just like that, that's a picture that tells a story. And just depending on how you paint it or who might end up encountering this book of yours later on, they, they may think that the book came that way. And then they realize later, oh, that was that was just special to to my copy. And I, I told I tell you all I'm not good, I'm not good at the minimalism, but <laughs> I'm trying, but I'm like, oh, these mountains need just a little bit more, just a little bit more. So yeah, there you go just like that. Well, I'm going to sit this back here and let this dry. And yeah, I'm really proud of really proud of how those came to life. I mean, it's it's something that that I like to do just for fun. Now, I will say if you get this book, you know, you, this one has some character to it now. <laughs> there's definitely um, some um, there's definitely some remnants that yeah, this book was hand painted. But yeah, this is just a way that you can you can practice peace. You know, you don't have to be an artist. You don't have to know all the color theory. That's why I really emphasize just using one color because that's it takes that pressure off of needing to blend colors. It takes that pressure off of needing to just make it all make sense. You can just take your time and paint. And that's something I, I just want to encourage you to do, even if it's not painting, to just look for things in your life that maybe you used to do them as a kid, or maybe it's just something that you enjoy doing, but you don't really have like a purpose for it or it doesn't feel productive. So you don't end up doing it as much. What are those things? And how can you bring those back into the fold of your life? And that's what painting has been for me. I didn't start off being an artist in my adult years. I actually tried very, very hard to, I had my, my first job out of college was, was in a cubicle. I was an admission counselor at my college, my alma mater that I graduated from, Point University, and I had a blast. I enjoyed the job so much. However, my, my job that I was working, it was moving to a different part of the state. And at the time, I wasn't able to move with it. And I ended up being launched into this whole wild world of freelancing and being a creative a freelancer. And that was very uncertain for a very, very long time. 
And painting would not have been the thing that I would have thought I would have done because I was in a time where people were like starting to, to get notoriety from Instagram and all that kind of stuff. And I was seeing where, you know, where it's like before the word influencer, the word blogger and lifestyle blogger. I'm like, oh, that's what you have to do in order to, to be seen or to be able to, to, you know, have enough money to be able to, to live with what you make. Took me a long time to realize that I was putting a lot of pressure on myself to try to be like everybody else. And what I needed to do was to focus on how I had been uniquely created and uniquely gifted. And there was absolutely nothing wrong with that. And when I was a kid, my my dad told me, he said, God made you to create. And my mom encouraged me to create every single day. And I can see now, I'm like, oh, I spent a long time really overthinking that, really thinking that it needed to be so much more and, and just become this big organized thing. And who knew? It came down to doing the things that six-year-old Morgan loves to do that ended up paving the way for me to be able to write books and be here with you all today. So yeah, I just love to encourage people to go out and seek out those practices in your life. And if it happens to be painting with the color blue, you'll end up with some some cool blue uh, paint to look at around your house. So yes, yes. Thank y'all for, for joining me in that. And I wish you could see my desk. I definitely got paint all over my desk, but that's okay. We're just going to go with it. And now I actually want to get to some of your questions. I'm so grateful for everyone that submitted questions. And um, I, yeah, just want to get to those. So the first one here, um, some of the question is cut off, so I can't quite see how it, how it finishes off. But this is from, I believe, Dana in New York who says your art process seems so meditative. Thank you. It really is. Can you talk a little bit about the process of creating your art and how you achieve the, and that's where it got cut off. So I'm so sorry about that. I don't, I don't quite see the end of that question there, but I feel like it might be about, you know, just how do you achieve like what you're creating and, and, oh, how do you achieve the flow? Oh, that, yeah, it's a good question. How do you achieve the flow of creating a piece of art? Well, I feel like I may have kind of explained that already with the process that I just showed, you know, paint all over my hands and all over my sweater and my desk. But really it is that it's allowing myself to have as few rules as possible. Now, if you notice, I didn't say no rules. I think you need to have some kind of rules for yourself. Because if you just sit down and say, here are all the colors. I went to the store. I bought some paint. I bought some paper. Or I got an iPad. And I got the apps. And I'm just, what am I going to make? Then it, it's endless. <laughs> and endless can mean nearly impossible to start. So for me, my very, 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 very first rule is who am I making this for? Who am I making this for? And as I become more advanced, if you will, sometimes it's, I don't know, like I have enough like uh, muscle memory now with making that I can just start making and figuring out as I go. But I would say like three years ago, oh no, 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 no. I couldn't do that. I had to sit down and say, who is this for? And sometimes it was for myself. And sometimes it was for someone who would email me or send me a message on Instagram. I'm like, I'm going to make this with this person in mind. Or maybe it was something I saw on the news. And as I was watching the news story, I, I just caught the, 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 a glimpse from someone's face and their face just stayed with me. I'm like, I'm going to make this for them. And that is something that I always, always start with. And that, that guides a lot of my, my creative practice all the way around. And then for, for the flow aspect of it, I am a huge fan of just, once that part's figured out, it's like, okay, we're just going to go crazy. Like, we're just going to use all the blues, all the colors, and then we're going to edit later. So sometimes that can feel a little intimidating when you're painting like on a canvas or something. But for instance, even the canvases that are behind me right now, they have been through so many different renditions. For instance, these two right here directly behind me were all blue at one point. And I even posted them and shared them with everyone as complete blue pieces. And then I was just like, 
no, I don't want them to be blue anymore. And then I just added, started adding stuff and I still don't know how I feel about them. So I just, it's kind of an ongoing thing, just letting myself add and add and add. And then I take a step back and I edit and I say, hmm, I, I like that part. Let me kind of move the paint around to focus on this part. And I'll do that digitally or physically. So yeah, that, that's a little bit of the process. Another question is, where do you get inspiration from? Is there someone significant who has played a role in it? That's a really good question. And it's something I actually talk about in the book. I talk about this concept of inspiration and how inspiration is actually another word for inhalation a lot of times. And I think we oftentimes think about inspiration as being like, okay, I got to like take some stuff and make some, so I can make some things. But inspiration, I think, is actually just the process of taking in. So we have to inspire. We have to inspire ourselves and we have to take in ourselves. We have to inspire, inspire, inspire. And then when we get, are ready to exhale, after we've inspired properly, after we inhale properly, then we can help others inspire. So that's how I think about creativity and inspiration. I don't, I, I don't necessarily think of it as like is one big, pro they're separate processes. Like it's a separate process. I have to be filled up before I can pour out. I have to be in a position of, okay, I've been taking in, I've been listening. I've been just taking, taking time to rest and all that good stuff before I put out. So in terms of particular person, I, I don't know necessarily. I, I think it kind of comes from all over I mean, as a kid, I, from a young age, and I'm still this way, I just, I always felt so connected to nature. And I always felt and still feel that God speaks to me through nature. And I literally have so many memories in my life, even when there was tons of uncertainty in my life and I was broke or whatever, where I could just remember as clear as day what those colors of the sunset were. Or I could just remember the, the mist, like there was this one trip that I had to take back in the day. And it was so, it was like a long road trip across several states. It was very exhausting, very strenuous, financially, emotionally, all the things in some kind of way during that trip, we got to spend a few, we got to spend a few hours, maybe even just like an hour, it may have been less than a few hours at Niagara Falls. And I still to that, to this day, can remember what it felt like to just exhale in that moment and hear that water rushing. And yeah, for me, that's, that's, for me, that's God speaking through creation. And I'm so inspired by that. It's one of my main sources of inspiration. And then from there, it's just all over the place. Like it's, it can be inspired by my two-year-old son. Like I have legitimately been inspired by like silly memes that I've seen on TikTok. And I'm just like, this is hilarious. And I just can't stop thinking about it. So it's all over the place. I try to just like stay, stay pay attention to to what's going on in the world and just take it in and, and then eventually all that ends up coming out in some way. <laughs> um, yeah. So what inspired you to write this book now? Uh, that's such a good question. And, you know, it was both personal and also just what I see happening in the collective personally, what I was dealing with, with my, my diagnosis and just looking back in my own life while also knowing that all around me, there are other people who are doing the same. We're all having to ask questions about like, what is normal? What is a normal life? Or, you know, maybe, maybe even if things got back to normal, I don't even want to return to that old way of living or doing that thing that I used to do. We're all asking questions like that in some capacity. So I did have that going on in my life in a, in a very huge way that was incredibly life altering. So this is my attempt at saying, all right, here's what I'm learning. And I just want to invite you on that journey of what I've been learning as well. So another question is, oh, and those questions were from Cassidy in Minnesota and Heather in Boston and Michelle in Oscada. Thank you all so much. Oscada, Michigan. Probably said that wrong. I'm so sorry. How did you begin painting and illustrating? What's your journey been like? That's from Shelby in Florida. I started painting when I was... Um, a kid, but not professionally. I mean, I, I painted like, like, I'm, I'm talking like dollar store paint, like, oh, let's just try to paint some stuff. Um, and I remember taking like one art class when I was a kid, but 
I, to be completely transparent, I don't remember being very interested in it. I was just like, it's kind of fun, but I think I just kind of want to do my own thing. So it wasn't until I was uh, 2017, I was 27, that I started to go to the store and buy some paint. And I'm like, I'm going to paint like a canvas. And I think I had done that once when I was 16. And then took a very long break. And at 27, that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to buy a canvas. I'm going to buy another canvas. And that's when it started to kind of grow a little bit more from there. Tyler from Virginia asked, did you ever dream that you would become a household name? How has your experience been with the fame and having a large following? I never dreamed of this. I, at the most, I thought, okay, I, it would be nice to write a book. And that was that credit to my mom as a kid. She was like, you should write a book because she could see that I love to write stories and I would doodle and things like that. But no, it never stops being surreal. I, I honestly am so shocked by it because when I was in music, I was very aware. Um, so I, I toured as a musician for about five years and I, I had a record deal and <laughs> I was I was in that world and I was very aware when I was in that world. And I even think things have changed a little bit recently because, uh, you know, technology has even improved over the past few years. But back then, at least what I was exposed to was like, you kind of have to be like a household name or known to really even make it in music, to be able to financially be able to make it. So I kind of went through a phase where I was just like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do to like try to be known and like try to get people to hear my stuff? And oh, I just tried and honestly failed a lot of times. I didn't know how to do that. And I always felt like, you know, some people have like a star quality. And I was like, I don't have that. I mean, I auditioned for all the shows, American Idol, America's Got Talent, The Voice. Um, I feel like there's another one. But those three definitely, oh, X Factor. And of all four of them, two of them I auditioned, two sep no, except for the X Factor, I auditioned for all the other three at least two, two times. And I made it to varying degrees of, of like the process. Like sometimes I would make it past the, uh, the first audition, sometimes I would make it past the second one. But at the end of the day, I was always told no. I was always told, you're not what we're looking for. And I always felt like, well, I, I guess I just don't have what it takes. I'm just going to go and try to figure out something else to just some way to create the, and not focus on how the, the, the quantity of people, but just the quality and, and just making things that, that can connect with people in a meaningful way. And that's where the painting came in. And ironically, that ended up being the thing that just really took off. So it, it never, never ceases to amaze me. And I am very grateful. Um, Kathleen from California asks, what's something you would tell a young girl in high school right now struggling with friends and peer pressure? Oh, that's something that's very, very dear to my heart and something that I, that I experienced myself. And I would say that to know that it is absolutely okay if your community looks different than everyone else, it might be smaller even than what you see with other people. But if you can find one friend or two friends, and maybe that friend, right? Sometimes that friend might be like an, an elderly neighbor or it might be a cousin or a sibling. It's okay if you don't have like a big crew or if you don't fit in with everybody. Sometimes it's those, oftentimes I think in my life, it's been those unlikely connections that end up teaching us so much more than we could ever imagine. And by me having been someone who has struggled a lot with making friends, especially when I was your age in high school, I could definitely see how the unlikely friendship that I ended up making with people who are maybe, you know, like <laughs> becoming <laughs> friends with a teacher, you know, not like you know, just like, oh, the only person I'm talking to is a teacher, or I'm friends with this person who's a little bit younger than me, or we don't have that much in common. All those different things ended up helping me become a better communicator. And I actually had someone give me a compliment to the, the other day, and I was so grateful. And they were like, Morgan, you know so many random things about random topics. I feel like you could have a meaningful conversation with anybody. And I was like, that's a huge compliment. And I think I learned that from having to find unique creative ways to make connection with other people. So 
I want to acknowledge that that is, it's incredibly hard. And I know it's, it's even harder for kids these days. I mean, y'all have, it's a lot different. It's a lot different even than when I was a kid. So just know that if it's, if it feels hard, it's because it is, but you're allowed to pace yourself through it. You're also allowed to seek support and seek help without any shame. If you feel lonely, if you feel discouraged, please seek out help, please, 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 please. And finally, just know that it's okay if your community looks different. So thank you for asking that. Um, Ellie in North Dakota asked to a newbie in painting, what's your advice? Get you some blue paints and you can still see that and some water and just have fun. <laughs> That's what I would say. Uh, Kaylin in Utah asked, how did you and your husband meet? We met in college. We met in college at our school, Point University in East Point, Georgia, which is now West Point, Georgia. And we, yeah, that's where we met. I feel like our story is really boring. <laughs> but, um, oh, yeah, we met in college and and we got married, um, I guess, like seven months. No, less than that. I think like five months after I graduated. So, Yeah. Shannon in Illinois asked, how was your transition into motherhood? You know, I think I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> like, I still have days where I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I'm like responsible for someone's life. Like, this is, wow, this is a lot. Um, but it, it surprisingly has been, um, I feel like in a lot of ways, it, it hasn't, it hasn't been, at least at this point, I, I don't know if it's because I'm just, you know, maybe it's anxiety. I think I had a lot of anxiety around like, what if I do this wrong? Or what if I do that wrong? And there's still all these things that you have to figure out as you go. But I, I do think that it has turned out to be like, wow, the same, the same tools that you have to figure out other uncertainties in your life or, or other new experiences, you apply it to parenthood. You know, I, I think that Sometimes there are some things that are very specific to parenthood, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm also inspired and encouraged by people who, who maybe are a caretaker for, for a parent or, you know, they're someone, they have someone dependent on them who's not even their child. So I think that there's a lot out there to be inspired by other people. And I just try to do that. I try to listen to as, as many stories from others as I can and, and, and recognize that it's not all on me to figure it all out at once. So yeah, thank you for asking that. I think I'll try to get a couple more in here. Um, where, um, I had one that I wanted to try to get. Uh, Peyton in Texas asked, um, how important is it to have a clear headspace? How is your faith incorporated into your daily life and rhythms? You know, I would say that that I feel like for me, you know, how I, how I clear my head and 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 how faith is incorporated in that is 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 through praying. Praying is very important for me. Um, I remember as a kid, you know, learning about like you know like like with a way to pray or you know like all these steps. But I think somewhere along the way, I, I don't remember when I specifically started doing this, but I just started to give myself permission to to just recognize that those moments where I need to just get something out and say something. And I'm like, I'm frustrated about this or I'm confused about this, or this is consuming my mind or my time, or I don't know what to do. Like oftentimes those utterances can become prayers. So I ha I do feel like over the past few years, I've become even more practiced in, 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 if I have some of these kind of emotional utterances, like, Oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. It's just like, Hey, say, Hey God, so there's this thing. Um, it's really stressing me out. It's really freaking me out, and I don't know what to do. So I would say it's a lot of that for me. It's a lot of that, just giving myself permission to just let it out and to not focus on like, okay, let me make sure you know I say this in the exact right way. Um, but just, but just, um, yeah, kind of, kind of praying as a way of, of conversation with God. Like that's that's what that that's what it has looked like for me lately. And, and that has just felt very, 
very sacred and 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 something that I I want to continue to practice. So yes, so Lindsay in Arizona, who's in Arizona with me? Um, <laughs> I said it like <laughs> like Lindsay's like right there, but no, we're both in Arizona. Uh, asks what are some practical ways to invite peace into your life? What are some of your favorite ways to un unwind? This is something I write about in the book. I talk about a concept called. Um, I'm sorry, it doesn't have a con it doesn't have a name, but it's the concept of, of lighting a candle. So I I I recognize because I have a sensory processing disorder kind of within my autism diagnosis, you know, also being autistic, but I have um I have a major sensitivity to bright lights. I mean, it really, really gets to me. Even right now, I only have natural light and the computer screen light and a very, very dim candle right here. I mean dim lamp. And I try to eliminate as much bright light as I can. And one thing I've learned about candles is that candles can help us help me remind myself that I am not meant to burn bright like a fluorescent light bulb that can burn for thousands of hours. I am much more like a candle. I can burn for a little while, but eventually that wax is just like, hey, I need a break. <laughs> like You're going to have to just, you know, give me a break. So a lot of times what I'll do, especially later in the day when, you know, the house is not getting as much natural light, I will light a candle. And if I'm like journaling, if I'm working on something, I'm like, all right, when that candle gets ready to go out, I am going to just blow it out and I'm going to walk away. And I'm going to use that as my cue to take a break. So that's a practice I like to give to people. Like it doesn't have to be one of those candles that has like 12 wicks in it, you know, <laughs> just get like a single wick candle and just observe and notice how that candle can't just go and go and go and go and go. And sometimes we pressure ourselves to do that way. So I think to do that, I think it's really important to have those visual reminders. And that's just like a, a practical one that, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of people could try and that I recommend. So I think I'll try to get one more question here. And this is from either, I'm sorry, either Kira or Kyra in Florida, who asked how to stay afloat amidst motherhood, work, life, etc. It's hard not to feel like I'm drowning sometimes. I want to start by saying, you know, I I am so, you know, I I, I empathize with you. And, and I'm sorry that that's the way it feels. And I can relate. I can relate. And what I have had to continue to remind myself of, and also my friends and people in my life, is that there is so much pressure and weight on the average person to just function, not even thrive, but to just function. And even if you go back like a decade or two ago, just the, the sheer amount of responsibilities that we have to keep up with on a daily basis, even small things, is astronomical. And this is something as someone who is autistic and, and actually deals with a lot of executive functioning um, issues and, and, and differences in my life, I am very attuned to that. I mean, even things that, are, that seem as simple as keeping up with passwords or, or, or keeping up with not even just your schedule, but now someone else's schedule and not even just their schedule, but the digitized calendar version of the schedule and who else is connected and all of that. It's just, it goes on and on and on and on and on. So I think we just have to continue to extend grace for ourselves that we don't have to do it all. We can't do it all. And that is absolutely okay. And there will definitely be moments where people in our lives might be disappointed or might be like, oh, you can't do this. And they might try to make us feel bad. And we have to say, hey, it is what it is. I did what I could do today. And what matters is well-being and health. And we have to prioritize those things. So I think it's a matter of, you know, just regularly reevaluating of like, what can I take off my plate? Because if you're asking that question, I already know you have a lot on your plate. And it's just regularly evaluating and reevaluating. What can I take off? What can I take a break from? What can wait? What can wait? I was literally doing that like, <laughs> like, like 20 minutes before this event. I was looking at something like, oh, that's going to wait. That one's going to wait till next month. It absolutely is. I could do it now, but I'm not going to. It's going to wait. So I hope that that's something you can incorporate 
as well. So I just wanted to end on some some fun questions. I have about a minute left, and these are just some some fun questions to just kind of answer and 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 leave on that note. Um, where were you born? I was born in Long Beach, California, but grew up in grew up in Georgia mostly. Um, number two, who would you want to play you in a movie? I have no. <laughs> No idea. I have no idea. I don't feel like I know any actors that would um, that I could even think of. I, I honestly am not sure. Uh, what was your first job? PacSun in the mall. And what chore do you hate doing? Washing dishes. What is your biggest fear? Bears. Not a fan of bears. Um, who makes you uh, laugh the most? Um, you know, I think I think my my two year old does, and also right now there is a, a, a TikTok creator named Art by Demarcus Sean, who's absolutely hilarious. And um, uh, and on this one, what is your favorite? What was your favorite school subject? Art, which I feel like that's probably obvious, but. <laughs> It's true. But yeah, those are just some fun questions. And I hope that I was able to get to as many of the questions as I could. And I tried to answer, tried to answer them. I'm so, so, so grateful for you all being here. This has been such a joy to just be able to share this book. And, you know, even during this time, like I know there's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot going on in our personal lives. And I just hope that this was a moment that helped you take a deep breath just for a moment as you prepare for whatever lies ahead. So yeah, I'm Morgan Harper Nichols and, and thank you all so much for joining me today. And finally, if you'd like to get the book, if you haven't already, you can do so at premiercollectibles.com backslash practice. Thank you all so much. Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.